Um, so, our next speaker is Dr. Russell Wilcox, currently at the University of Navarre, and he's going to be talking to the title Neuroscience and Freedom. Russell. Right, let me explain first of all. Um, um, I was originally um, um, asked to um, step in um, Professor Jimenez Amaya behalf of Professor Jimenez Amaya, whose paper you have. Um, but I thought rather than, since everybody has, has read that paper, and rather than um, sort of articulate his views and then defend a position in a sense which is not really my own, perhaps it would be more useful um, for me just to, uh, to offer a few ideas that have, 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 have been you know, developing in my own mind about about this this question, which have have germinated even more um, during the course of the uh, of, of the of the conference. Particularly, I wanted to try and set out in uh, as simply as possible um, a more Aristotelian, optimistic account of perhaps how this um, the problem of free will might, uh, might be approached and in doing so I don't want to um, go into the details of um, how Aquinas or Aristotle would have um, divided up the various portions of, of, of the human act. I'd rather pl like to place it in a, in a broader metaphysical context. So to start with then, and this is a sort of, I <laughs> need to go through it rather breakneck speed, um, Thomistic metaphysic, because I, actually I think it, um, <coughs> given the interface between um, uh, philosophy, neuroscience, and physics, uh, this might place some of the terms that we're using in uh, in a sort of a, a slightly different context. So for a, for a, for Aquinas, um, reality is divided between act and potency. And he drew up these principles from Aristotle. An act, broadly speaking, be described as that which is. Potency, that which can be. Now, potency is different to um, simple non-existence because um, non-existence doesn't necessarily entail the, the same sort of um, capacity to become that, that potency has. Um, in term with respect to the um, physical world, these two co metaphysical co-principles work themselves out um, in, in terms of form and matter. The form is the principle of act and matter is the principle of potency. What's meant by that is um, um, the following, <laughs> broadly speaking. The form is um, uh, the structure of a thing and matter is its principle of individuation in space and time. So if you have three tables structured in the same way, they have a common form, but they're individuated in three different portions of matter. Um, now understanding uh, um, uh, the world in which human action takes place actually requires understanding the different levels of being which exist within uh, the human person. So <coughs> uh, um, in some sense the human person is a, is a, is a, is a microcosm of the, uh, uh, the physical world, the physical universe, but also in important respects goes beyond it. So you have this big um, division within the material, physical realm between the inanimate and the animate. Um, uh, of course, anima uh, originally means soul, which is the first principle of, of life. So the living and the non-living. Uh, within the animate uh, realm, you have three different levels of life. The vegetative, um, plants, etc., which manifest um, in varying degrees the three powers of nutrition, growth, and reproduction. The sensitive, again, the varying degrees, 
the animal, animal realm, which manifest in, a, in addition to the capacities of nutrition, growth and reproduction, that of perception, locomotion and um, appetite. And then the human realm, the realm of man, the realm of the rational being, which in addition to all the vegetative capacities and all the sensitive capacities have uh, distinctively human capacities of intellect and will. Um, so you've got a hierarchical um, cosmological structure, so to speak, um, uh, which manifests an order of supersession, the lower building of, or, or the higher building upon the lower, and drawing it up. The intellect and the will, which are the distinctively human capacities, but always operate in conjunction with and in harmony with um, sensitive and vegetative capacities, um, are said to be, in their essence, immaterial. Now, if we go back to this notion of matter being the principle of individuation in space and time, they're not individuated in space and time. This is the idea that they're not individuated in space and time. What that means in terms of the intellect is that the intellect <laughs> is a very simplistic um, sort of summary, but the intellect is the idea that it can abstract from material particulars. So if we think about, we think about the form of three tables, which is the fact that we're able to recognize it as the same, um, across the three individual particulars um, it suggests that we have a capacity to um, in some sense lift or abstract away from um, the particularizations of space and time. The intellect is the um, cognitive immaterial capacity whereas the will is the appetitive immaterial capacity and the two in very complex ways which I don't have time to go into in this understanding interpenetrate one another and these are I think um, Professor Kane and um, Dr Doyle mentioned about the, the, the rich the richly complex account of this interpenetration which the medievals um, and the medievals uh, developed so if the intellect is able to um, no truth, the, um, to assimilate the true, the will is not entirely undetermined. The will is determined, but it's not determined to particular material goods. It's determined to the good in general, to the good without qualification, to the good in a way which is not qualified by space and time. However, we are irreducibly material beings and consequently we always have to make our choices within the context of choosing between material particulars. So although were it the case that we were faced with an unmediated absolute good, our will would adhere to it um, as of necessity. This simply doesn't occur in um, our bodily existence. And the uh, capacity to choose between material particulars in a way which is consistent with our overall absolute good, or with the overall absolute good, is the locus of what is often termed um, free will in modern parlance, but actually is probably better described as, as, as free choice. Um, Now, this is dependent upon, it's not, an, it's important here, it's not, in terms of the will itself, it's not an a-causal account, because the will is a cause. The will, <coughs> but it's an immaterial cause. So, it's a cause which accounts for our capacity to um, engage in this process of deci free decision between material particulars. What it means is that on this view, no 
non-intellective or sub-intellective principle is sufficient for freedom. <clears throat> the will then operates at a qualitatively higher uh, level which is distinctive and operates in a distinctive way and it's a cause which in a real sense comes from outside space-time. Um, now, my take on free will position is that there's something which will remain somewhat mysterious to us about what it is to actually make a choice and what it is the will actually consists in. Because we're not entirely pellucid to ourselves. It doesn't mean to say that we shouldn't try and explain how it operates as fully as possible, but in explaining that we always have to recognize that there are certain irreducible um, qualities that it, that it um, manifests. Now, there are a number of problems, I think, for this um, account, which I've, you've probably have canvassed in some of the questions, particularly the ones that I asked to Antoine. I, I don't think they're irresolvable, but I think that they do need to be resolved. And one is that if you have a cause coming from outside space-time, you have a question as to the individuation of uh, the locus or the origin of that cause. You also have, a, and these are slightly distinct questions, you also have <coughs> questions as to the individuation, the particular discrete uh, choices which result from um, that immaterial cause, from particular manifestations of that particular of, of that cause. Now, <clears throat> I've been throwing some ideas around in my head for a, for a few weeks about this, and <clears throat> I'm wondering whether or not it's possible. You see, if you don't have any temporal dimension in relation to acts of choice and you don't have any spatial dimension it becomes very difficult to say how do you distinguish one choice from another now I wonder and this is something I canvassed in my question to Antoine whether or not it's possible to have a temporal dimension without a spatial dimension which still renders it, this cause importantly, the manifestations of this cause importantly immaterial in the sense that the requirements of materiality are individuation in space and time. So I'm wondering whether or not, and this is something that the medievals started to look at, is that there's a, a third option between the temp between the material and and um, the eternal, and it seems to me that it is at least conceptually possible to have a temporal sequence or to have time without space, even though it wouldn't be possible to have space without time. Uh, <clears throat> but that's just speculation, and any contributions from the floor will be most welcome. <laughs> But I think these are the type of questions that we get, have, to, have to really sort of grapple with if we're going to make sense of the notion of causes coming from outside, out, outside space-time. And ultimately, if we're going to try and connect back in a, in a rich way to, to this, this, this older tra tradition which has, tried to, which has tried to sort of deal with questions of um, freedom and free decision. Um, and I do think, given the problems with the alternative approaches, that this 
my instinct is that this is the most productive um, avenue. Doesn't mean to say it's short of philosophical problems, it's not. But I think those problems <coughs> would appear to be less tra intractable than the problems which are posed by the alternatives. Anyway, this is my take. So, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. So...